Okay. So our next speaker is Oliver Gal from Nottingham, and he's going to tell us about EFTs for cosmological phase transitions. Great. Um, thank you very much to the organizers. Let's get straight on. So I'm going to talk today about cosmological phase transitions, and in particular, first order phase transitions. So these are phase transitions in which as the universe cools at some temperature and some temperature range, there's a coexistence of two phases. The dynamics of a first order phase transition is shown here in these, in these three pictures. So on the left, first uh, bubbles of the new phase, the lower temperature phase nucleate in the, the higher temperature phase. Then those bubbles uh, as the universe cools expand acceleratedly they collide and their collisions create fluid flows and gravitational waves. So as we've heard, this, this is um, an exciting possibility to, to probe particle physics, to probe the physics of the early universe, because these gravitational waves would free stream today and could be observable in uh, gravitational wave detectors. There are other possible uh, imprints and re remnants of a first order phase transition, such as topological defects. Again, as we just heard, uh, also they could uh, be the background for the production of baryons over antibaryons in, in something like electroweak baryogenesis or, or the seeds for magnetic fields. So we all know that gravitational waves were seen first in 2015 or directly observed by LIGO. There, there are also uh, many future experiments which, which plan to uh, significantly improve the sensitivity and, and investigate different frequency windows. And in particular for things like the electroweak phase transition, LISA um, is, is kind of in just the right frequency band. Um, so here's the pipeline for, for how one makes predictions for LISA from, from phase transitions and the, the gravitational wave signal that one would expect. So starting from some particle physics model, one imagines the Lagrangian like the standard model plus perhaps some, some new degrees of freedom. Um, one calculates from that particle physics Lagrangian what the phase transition looks like. So those are macrophysical uh, quantities, phase transition parameters, like the, the temperature which it happens. And then those macrophysical parameters then go into uh, numerical simulations of the fluid dynamics of, of, of what happens at the transition, which, which gives you a gravitational wave signal, which then gets compared to, to the sensitivity set of LISA and, and then gives you a signal to noise ratio. So in today's talk, I'm going to focus on this first step, the, the relationship between the particle physics Lagrangian and these uh, the uh, quantities which characterize the phase transition, these phase transition parameters. Uh, it's sensible to split them up into here into three different kinds. So um, we're imagining there's some scalar field and there's some effective potential for the scalar field. And, and as the temperature varies, uh, at some point, there are two minima, and at some special temperature, the critical temperature, those two minima have the same height. And, and as the temperature changes, the, minima, the height of the minima varies. So if there are two minima with a, with a barrier between them, we have a first order transition. And, and that's the most basic quantity characterized in the phase transition, its order. Uh, we can also calculate its critical temperature, its latent heat, and the sound speed, all of which just depend on homogeneous quantities, hom the homogeneous phase, phases, basically. In addition, uh, the bubbles, which actually characterize the dynamics, um, are sort of somewhat out of equilibrium because the, uh, a system with bubbles in it being produced is, uh, is out of equilibrium. So the bubble nucleation rate, which is, which is crucially important for this gravitational wave signal, is a kind of near equilibrium quantity, which we need to calculate. And, and then a little bit further from equilibrium is the bubble wall speed. That's the asymptotic speed that the bubbles reach as they grow. And the standard approach to computing these parameters is based on a one loop approximation to the effective potential. So here it is on the left, I've, I've written effective potential as a function of some scalar field phi and some temperature t. And at zero temperature, it's just the sum of the a tree level term and all the one loop terms, which together make this Coleman Weinberg piece. So the, the effective mass here is the second derivative of the tree level part with respect to phi. But in the presence of a thermal bath, we also have thermal corrections. Here's the Bose distribution uh, of the energy divided by the temperature. And then there's additionally a term uh, called the daisy term, which uh, corrects the fact that the effective mass of this particle is not just V dash dashed, 
but also has a thermal correction. So here you can see this pi t is the, the thermal correction to, to the mass of, of this particle phi. Um, it's worth noting here that normally one expects there to be a tree level term and then small one loop corrections, but of course at high temperatures, this thermal correction is large. And this thermal correction here is just as big as the tree loop part. And this daisy term can also be large. It's also worth mentioning that this potential has imaginary parts and one typically takes the real part to determine the phases and critical bubbles, disregarding the imaginary part, fixing a gauge parameter, fixing the renormalization scale and ignoring derivative corrections for, for the bubble. This is the standard approach. Here's a, a plot of the gravitational wave signal taken from a paper from 2019. So we have gravitational wave amplitude on the, on the y-axis and frequency on the, the x-axis. And we have two different approximations shown here for a scan of this model. So this is the, the Lagrangian for this particle physics model is the standard model plus here phi is the Higgs and then sigma is some new real scalar. So this is the standard model plus one real scalar. And here in green, we have the result without the daisy term that, that we had before, and in dark red, the result with the daisy term. And what's sort of immediately obvious from this plot um, is that the, the amplitude of the gravitational wave signal varies depending on this approximation by a lot. By if, if you look at the numbers, it's something like 10 orders of magnitude, which is a sign that maybe things are going a bit awry. Um, we can go a bit further. Here's a, here's a study from another paper uh, looking at some kind of toy model uh, where we take the standard model and we add uh, Higgs to the six operator with a, with a coefficient one over M squared where M is some fixed number. So this is one physical parameter point. And then if we vary the renormalization scale at that one physical parameter point, we get a, an uncertainty band. And this red band is that uncertainty band. And, and again, we see, I don't know, four orders of magnitude uncertainty in the gravitational wave amplitude, showing that something really is going wrong. And exactly what, I don't know, this, this, this paper was, was kind of my entry into this topic and, and my thinking about what, what's going wrong. Why are there these huge theoretical uncertainties? And uh, there've been a number of proposals going back a long way to of potential sources of theoretical uncertainty for these kind of studies. So Linda back in 1980 pointed out that non-abelian gauge theories in general at high temperatures have a non-perturbative sector. Their infrared modes are non-perturbative. So that could be the source of this uncertainty. Uh, Eric Weinberg amongst others has pointed out various inconsistencies with the approach I mentioned before. For example, these imaginary parts. And in addition, the, uh, the unjustified derivative expansion and uh, uh, some double counting of modes in the path integral. Um, there are also potentially higher order corrections. There's gauge dependence. This, this whole analysis is gauge dependent and renormalization scale dependent. So, so what's going wrong? Um, okay, so, so that's my motivation and, and I've discussed a bit theoretical uncertainties. I'm going to now go on to talking about scale hierarchies, uh, hierarchies of energy scales and phase transitions. And then, and then the problems that we've, that I've just mentioned and, and solutions which, which one can make with effective field theory. Okay, so scale hierarchies. Now to set the scene, I'm going to bring us back to a hierarchy problem or the hierarchy problem. Let's assume we have, again, the standard model plus some new particle, chi, which is heavy. Let's imagine it's a real scalar and it's much heavier than the Higgs. So its mass, n chi, is much, much larger than the Higgs mass. And it's coupled to the standard model via a portal coupling g squared to the Higgs. Now we should be able to integrate out chi if we're interested in low energy physics. And if we do so, the Higgs mass gets a correction, uh, delta m squared uh, from this diagram here. This is the leading diagram. So where the, the dashed line is the chi particle and the, the full line is the Higgs particle. So this correction has a vertex g squared and it has a, a loop, a Feynman loop part, uh, which just is the mass of this chi particle squared. So if, if we look at this correction to the Higgs mass and divide it by the Higgs mass itself, so we look at the relative correction of the relative, yeah, the relative correction, we find that it's small when the coupling is small, 
but it's large when the chi mass is large. So what I've said here is that relevant operators in the infrared get large contributions from the UV. And this is just the hierarchy problem. Um, so if M chi is really large, then somehow we need G to be really small. Anyway, this hierarchy problem is directly relevant to phase transitions. And in phase transitions, it's not a problem at all. What I've shown here is the effective potential as a function of phi at three different temperatures, at zero temperature, some high temperature and an intermediate temperature around TC. So the effective potential, if we write it as the effective potential is the tree level potential plus fluctuations or the contribution from fluctuations, thermal or quantum. Uh, if we look at these fluctuations, they have to modify the potential at leading order because if you look at the potential at high T, it's very different from how it is at low T. So if, if we think of at high T, the result is the tree level plus fluctuations, these fluctuations must be large. They must be at least as big as the tree level potential. Now that's potentially dangerous if we have uh, loop corrections being as large as the tree loop part, uh, but I'll explain how that kind of arises. If we look at the correction to, these, to this potential from the fluctuations divided by the tree loop part, Again, it's as we saw before with the hierarchy problem discussion, there's some coupling squared, or sorry, some, some coupling, uh, potentially an N for the number of degrees of, number of fluctuating degrees of freedom, if we have more than one. And then there's a ratio of scales to some power where that power is positive for relevant operators. Now, for there to be a phase transition at all, we need the fluctuations to be at least as big as the tree level term. If they're not, then, then we don't get this kind of structure where the potential looks different at different temperatures, qualitatively different. So this must be at least of order one. Now, how can this happen? We've basically got two choices. Either we have strong coupling, in which case this is order one or more, and then this can be say order one. Or if we demand that we have weak coupling because we want to be able to do some calculations, then this is small. And so for this to be order one, we need a hierarchy of scales. The, the energy scale of fluctuations must be UV compared to the energy scale of the phase transition. Uh, so if we want a phase transition in, in perturbation theory, there must be a, a scale hierarchy. Okay, so hopefully I've motivated scale hierarchies. And now I'm going to go on to discuss various problems uh, and the stuff that was discussed at the beginning and, and how effective field theory can offer solutions. So, the discussion of effective field theory for, for high temperature physics goes back at least to at least to the 90s, uh, Farrakos, Kayantier, uh, et al, Broughton and Nieto, uh, Shaposhnikov and others. Um, and here I just give an example for, for QCD. So there are potentially an infinite number of energy scales. But if you think about thermal fluctuations, if we consider fluctuations of energy scales much larger than the temperature, they're Boltzmann suppressed, they're exponentially suppressed. So they're irrelevant. So the kind of en energy scales which can do something interesting in, in a thermal context, the highest scale relevant is the thermal scale, pi t. And as I mentioned earlier, for there to be a phase transition, there also need to be lower scales. Then there needs to be a hierarchy of scales. And in a weakly coupled theory, such lower scales arise naturally by powers of the coupling times the temperature. So here we have the Lagrangian of QCD. So there's the gluons and there's the quarks. Now, if we integrate out this thermal scale, that in, uh, we get some effective theory in which the quarks are fully integrated out because the quarks are all thermal. And all but uh, the zero Matsubara modes of the gluons are left. So the, the thermal bath breaks Lorentz invariance. So the, the temporal and the spatial modes now appear differently. The temporal modes getting into biomass and the spatial modes not, but we can continue to integrate out another scale and then we get some effective theory on the, sh on the, on the lowest energy scales of just the spatial gluons. But the, so this is well known and the, and the details of this are, are not particularly important. The point is just that uh, when constructing these effective theories, we integrate out scales step by step and the highest scale is the thermal scale. And then there are potentially smaller scales which are the temperature times some powers of the coupling. Okay, so, um, 
renormalization scale dependence. We saw earlier there was this large renormalization scale dependence. So what's going on? At zero temperature, everything should work fine in a weakly coupled theory. In fact, the one loop potential, the tree level plus the one loop potential, is renormalization group invariant, uh, at least to the order calculated um, at zero temperature. However, at high temperatures, this fails, and it fails even at leading order, which is interesting. Um, the reason it fails, this, this part continues to hold, but the thermal parts don't cancel amongst themselves. And the reason is exactly going back to what I said before, is that the thermal contributions are large and they break the loop expansion. So if you stop at some fixed order in loops, you don't have all the contributions that are of, this, of the same size and powers of couplings. So, so this fails. And you, and you can even pinpoint the exact terms which don't cancel. And we did so in this paper. And in particular, it's this term where the, the running of the, the thermal corrections to, to the mass, uh, they don't cancel against anything. Um, now there's a solution to this problem. And the solution uh, is kind of straightforward in an EFT approach, because in the EFT approach, you don't just have an expansion in loops, you also have an expansion in uh, hierarchies of scale. And you realize that you kind of need, because of that, uh, you need to go, you can see that you need to go to a higher order to get this cancellation of scale dependence. In fact, you need to calculate the effective potential up to g to the four, t to the four. That's the order at which you get uh, scale independence. And we did so in this paper for the standard model plus a real scalar with the model I introduced earlier. And you can see here, so this is the critical temperature as a function of the renormalization scale. And these dashed yellow and green lines are one loop approximations. Green is without the daisy term, yellow is with the daisy term. And you can see as we vary the renormalization scale, the critical temperature in this one loop approximation varies from 120 to 160, something like that. So it varies. Whereas in this EFT approach, where we push to this minimal order where we get renormalization scale independence, it's basically a flat line showing you that we have pretty much renormalization scale independence. So, so if we, we solved that problem. Um, another problem that has been that has been raised in the literature is, is gauge dependence. The, the standard approach, the one loop approach I showed earlier is very much gauge dependent. And while unlike at zero temperature, the gauge dependence is not subdominant necessarily because of this hierarchy of scales breaking the one, the kind of loop structure of the, of the perturbative expansion, you actually get really large gauge dependence. So here, here is, uh, this is in the SU2 Higgs theory. The, so there's some gauge bosons and a Higgs. Uh, and this, is, this X is some parameter of the theory and this YC is basically the, the, the critical temperature. So what's plotted here in, in the gray band is the theoretical uncertainty or the range of values which one gets from a one loop approximation when you vary the gauge fixing parameter between zero and five. As you can see, this, this critical temperature varies a lot as you vary the gauge parameter from zero to five. In fact, this dashed region even shows that a new unphysical phase arises. Going to two loops helps a bit, but, uh, but not that much. There's still, there's still gauge dependence. And uh, we recently, recently showed that doing the same calculation in a, in a kind of purely EFT way using an EFT-based expansion, one gets exact order by order gauge invariance. Um, essentially, one makes an EFT for, for the Higgs by integrating out everything heavier and then does an H bar expansion within, within that EFT. And here are the results at leading order, next leading order, next to next to leading order. And not only are the results exactly gauge in the, uh, invariant order by order, but they're also much closer to these lattice points in black. So if you look here, this two loop result is not as good as our EFT result. Okay, and my, my final problem, which I want to discuss, is the thermal bubble nucleation rate. So it has, it has been, well, the story goes back to, to 1981 when Linda and Affleck, both in the same year, proposed, uh, uh, proposed uh, equations for the bubble nucleation rate at high temperatures. Interestingly, they both proposed different, different equations. And those differences uh, appear both in the exponent and in the prefactor. So Linda's, Linda's uh, bubble nucleation rate had some kind of effective thermal action, including an effective thermal potential, which Linda was careful not to define. 
uh, one drops the zero modes and has some prefactor of T, whereas Affleck drops the zero modes and the negative mode has a different prefactor, and in the exponent just has the tree level potential. So, so, so they differ all over the place. Note that if one were to put the one loop potential in here, you'd get an imaginary part up here. Uh, you'd also have some kind of broken derivative expansion. There would be, and you'd double count modes. Uh, so exactly what this VT is, is has, has gone uh, a little bit obscured. And so, sorry, nearly out of time, but nearly there. Um, so, in, in a paper from last year, uh, Jonas Hirvonen and I put forward a first principles definition of the thermonucleation rate, which kind of resolves this uh, long-standing discrepancy between these two approaches. And, and, and the, the definition is constructive. So one integrates out all energy scales above, uh, above some scale, capital lambda knuckle, or the nucleation scale, which is, which is the mass of the nucleating degree of freedom. Doing so yields a, a classical effective field theory, a classical statistical effective field theory with some nucleation action. And then once you have a classical theory, you know exactly how to calculate the nucleation rate because we have a rigorous classical nucleation theory uh, developed by Langer, which essentially unambiguously gives you the rate. So starting from the quantum theory, we integrate out to find a classical theory, and then we know the rate. That's, that's basically the, the steps. And uh, this resolves all those issues that we, that we saw before. This nucleation action is real for all values of phi. The derivative expansion is justified by a hierarchy of scales. Every mode is only counted once, so there's no inconsistency from double counting modes. And everything's independent of the, the, the scale at which you choose uh, to uh, the kind of matching scale. OK, so that, that's to my conclusions. So as I mentioned at the beginning, phase transitions could produce observable gravitational waves. I've got a plot here again of some gravitational wave amplitude versus frequency. This green band is a, is a one loop approximation and as you can see, it has very large theoretical uncertainty, something like six orders of magnitude. Going further using EFT methods, we can, we can reduce the uncertainty and we can solve many of the problems of the standard approach. Um, but the remaining uncertainty is related to non-equilibrium quantities and more work is needed there. Thank you very much. Thank you for the great talk, Oliver. Questions?